Joshua chapter 6. There's a lot in there. There's a lot of verses. It's the kind of story you can't just read a part of, otherwise you don't get the, the whole gist of the situation. So I left it to Gary to blow the trumpets this morning. There's a lot of trumpets in there, a lot of repetition. It's important that we stand on what the scripture says and that we are clear about what the scripture says today. I read a little story the other day in the paper about Glasgow Airport. Apparently at Glasgow Airport, where of course you fly to the Isle of Lewis, they, uh, they've just opened a fancy restaurant and of course nowadays they have to put up all the signs in Gaelic. Uh, although it's no use to anybody whatsoever outside the west of the far west of Scotland, but everything has to be in Gaelic all over Scotland. Even where they never spoke Gaelic historically, signs have to be in Gaelic. So they put all the new signs up for this fancy restaurant in Gaelic. And of course the people that did it didn't know. And they had to get a translation and it all went up in Gaelic. And they opened it to some great fanfare and then they found out it was in Irish. Uh, uh, not in Scottish, there's two kinds of Gaelic, you see, Scottish Gaelic and Irish Gaelic. And they'd open this fancy Highland restaurant, Gateway to the Western Isles, and it was all written in Irish. So they had to take it all down again and start again. But it's important to be clear that we know what we're talking about and what the Bible says. So there's two different ways of looking at the events of this chapter. We can, and we will shortly, hopefully, look at things from the point of view of Joshua and the children of Israel. We can learn something of how they related to the situation, how Joshua stood as God's man for God's time, and how they followed in obedience and saw the miracles of God. All big subjects themselves to squeeze into one Sunday morning service. But first we look for a moment at the other party involved. We'll look at the people of Jericho. Because this story is well read and I'm sure you all know the story very well. But the people of Jericho get overlooked. And there's something important to say about them. Jericho <coughs> was facing an unknown quantity when it faced Joshua and his people. The people of Jericho had heard of the miraculous crossing of the Jordan. And they knew that Joshua's God had supernaturally intervened for him. And they were fearful about what might happen when the Israelites attacked their city. Rahab the harlot, who was mentioned in that story, had previously told Joshua's two spies that the people of Jericho were fearful about what the God of Israel might do. So they knew something of the God of Israel, of his people, and of his marvelous dealings. Many people in the world like that today, they seem to be totally cut off, totally unknowledgeable. But people in the world very much are aware of the God of Israel, the, our father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're aware of him and they're frightened of him. They're frightened of what he may do. They're aware that their lives are not really how they should be. They are aware. People are more aware than you might think today that the world is going down the swanee. People are more aware that this country is heading, you know, not just down the Swanee, but somewhere much worse, very, very quickly. And people, particularly young people, are fearful for the future. But there is an awareness of God, and there is a fear of what he might do. They knew something, these people, but they chose to close their ears and their hearts, and they sealed themselves up inside their city walls, perhaps with the forlorn hope that if they simply ignored the problem for long enough, it would somehow go away. Like many people today who have heard something of the Lord God Jehovah and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, they have heard people speak in witness. They have heard of, maybe they've even seen for themselves incidents where God has intervened and worked on behalf of his people, but they have chosen to harden their hearts and shut themselves up inside their own walls. An obvious example from earlier in the scriptures would be that of Pharaoh, uh, when God repeatedly demonstrated his power and his relationship to Moses, and despite several plagues from the direct hand of God, Pharaoh determined to ignore it all, and the Bible says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. 
You'd think that after the frogs and the flies and the boils, Pharaoh would at least be a little inclined to change his attitude. I wouldn't have, I'd have coped all right with the frogs. I like frogs. I mean, you can have too many of them, but I quite like frogs. I don't mean to eat, I mean to, to play with. I like frogs, I'm not so keen on flies. The boils definitely would have got my attention and I would have probably have changed my attitude at that point. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he chose to close himself off to the truth of God. Through the gospel, we can several times see people who've done the same thing to the teachings and examples of Jesus. Men like Herod and Pilate and the Jewish religious leaders, hearts hardened against the gospel. Even those like Agrippa in Acts 26, who famously said, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And there's a limit to what we as Christians can do in these situations. It may well be that this is very personally important to you. There may be those in your own families, included amongst your nearest and dearest, who at this point in time appear to have done the same thing. Whatever you do to witness or to demonstrate the love of Christ to them, their hearts remain hardened and you can't get through. They, like the city of Jericho, have shut themselves up within firm walls and are hoping they can ignore the Lord for long enough to make him go away. They've walled themselves up against the Lord and his people and they are trusting in the strength and the solidity of their own walls to keep them secure. And in situations like these, once we've made our position clear and laid the gospel truth before them, there is very little we can do. And to be honest, there's often very little point in continuing to hammer on a closed door. We can, of course, we must, of course, persevere in prayer and in our private moment cry out to the Lord for the salvation of those we love. But only God's timing and the Holy Spirit's intervention can cause any movement. Indeed, it may even be counterproductive to continue banging on a closed door because you just hear them adding another bolt at the other side. So if that's similar to your situation, then pray and intercede in your closet by the power of the Spirit and rest and wait for God's timing to come around. Only he can soften the hardened heart and uh, break down the strong walls. Indeed, it's wrong. It can be spiritually damaging to adopt the ways of the world in these matters. It has been tried over and over, perhaps most recently in the idea of the purpose-driven movement or the emerging church teaching that declares that you should make church what people want it to be in order to win souls for Christ. And many churches have taken that on board and they've replaced true evangelism and they've replaced the teaching of scripture with a social program in a bid to make themselves attractive to the world. This may in the short term increase numbers, but in the long term, I believe it will result in spiritual loss rather than gain. And worse still, unsaved, unregenerate people can be lulled into a sense of false security of thinking they are saved when there has been no repentance and no real conversion because repentance hasn't been mentioned and without repentance there can be no forgiveness. That's one way in which through the centuries times of renewal have always been followed by times of compromise and worldliness. And unregenerate people have been promoted up through the ranks of the churches into positions of leadership until in time a once evangelical denomination has been spiritually shipwrecked in its entirety. Making the church into what people want it to be has never been God's way. There has always been a distinct separation between God's ways and the world's ways, which we will see again shortly. So even as Christians, we tend to want God to bless us. I hope you want God to bless you. Some of you don't look like it very much, but I hope so. Uh, but... Uh, 
I'll speak for myself. We sometimes want God to bless us in the way that suits us. We want his blessing, but on our terms. I might have told you this story. I don't know. I'll bore you with it again if I have. But I've had the great privilege of driving the Alaska Highway uh, four times, I think. Uh, 800 miles of the Alaska Highway lies within Canada. And, and it goes to the border and then into Alaska. And I've driven those 800 miles four times, twice in a leisurely fashion, um, from village to village, which are a very long way apart, and twice overnight. The advantage of driving overnight, this time of the year, there is really no darkness. There's, uh, when you get to the Yukon, the sun just hangs on the horizon uh, all night, and it's the land of the midnight sun. So you're not driving in darkness, but you're driving overnight, so you get the advantage of the wildlife that you don't see during the day. Uh, I've seen some incredible things. I parked the car in the middle of a herd of bison, opened the windows and listened to them munching either side of me. Absolutely superb. No traffic. I once drove 100 kilometres without passing another vehicle. That's how lonely it is. It's hundreds of miles between villages. But I was praying all the way along. I was seeing exciting things, caribou and bison and elk and all sorts. And I was praying for a grizzly bear. I said, Lord, I'd love to see a grizzly right by the side of the road. Give me a grizzly bear. And at some point, about three o'clock in the morning, I needed to use the loo, and, and they have what they call pullouts. We call them laybys. They they call them pullouts. And in this pullout, there's like a little telephone box sitting there in the middle of nowhere, and that's your toilet. And there's no water involved, of course. It's 100 miles to the nearest water pipe, but at least it's a facility. So I parked the car and I went to use the facilities, and then I heard something snuffling outside the door. This is three o'clock in the morning, a hundred and odd miles from the nearest village, not a human within screaming distance, and there's something snuffling outside the door of my toilet. And I held my breath, and I remained completely silent, and I did what I had to, and it helps if you're going to have a close encounter with a grizzly bear, it does help if you've got your trousers up. So I managed to get back to normal, and eventually, having waited many minutes in complete silence with my heart beating away, I just poked my nose out the door. It wasn't anything about, so I snuck off. <laughs> And the thing is, you don't look round. Just don't look round, because if you look round and see something, you'll panic. And if you panic, you'll, you'll, you'll upset it. And of course, never ever run. If you run, it will think you are a quarry and it will come after you. So I, I did the 100 or 200 yards or so back to my car and got in. And I know you're going to ask, I don't know what it was. I never found out what it was, because by the time I came out, it wasn't there. Had a very pleasant walk with a porcupine not long after, I think if I remember rightly. It could have been anything. But the point was, I was sitting there, and it was dark inside, of course, it was three o'clock in the morning, and I was sitting there and saying, Lord, I know I prayed for a grizzly bear, but not now. <laughs> not just at this moment. You see, what I'm meaning to say is that we want the Lord to bless us, but not in a way that doesn't suit us. We want him to fit in with our plans. In these strange days in which we are blessed to live through, there's never been a time when it has been more needful to make a separation between the church and the world, between what's of God and what isn't. People need to see today what believers have. It's not just about talking. It's not just about giving them a scripture. It is about that, but not just about that. People need to see that Christians have a full and thrilling moment-by-moment -moment relationship with the Savior. They don't need to see Christians behaving like the world, taking on board the world's values and views in order to be inclusive or jumping onto the bandwagon of the latest social issue, or using the world's psychology to tackle spiritual problems. They don't need to see that. They need to see Christian believers as being different because their faith is important to them. Important enough to them to make a difference in everything they do. Not just in what they do on a Sunday, not just in what they say when they are evangelizing, but they need to see that our faith, what we believe, makes such a difference to us that it affects everything that we do. 
That's where evangelism comes in, not just, partly of course, but not just witnessing to the scripture, but living in a way that people notice. Those who believe the Bible to be God's word and the gospel to be God's appointed way of eternal salvation, we are in a small minority in these days. And incidentally, we are in possibly the only minority that is not allowed to put its view. The only minority that isn't included in this devilish inclusive society which disturbs the whole world with its anti-Christian propaganda. I didn't see the programme, I had no intention of seeing the programme, I haven't got a television so it wasn't possible, but if I had a television I'd have no intention of seeing it anyway, but I have seen news clips on the internet, enough to know that what was called the Eurovision Song Contest was nothing more than an aggressive and threatening exhibition of so-called inclusivity and the message I got from the clips that I saw was we do not tolerate anybody who doesn't agree with us and our way of life it wasn't just about toleration it was aggressive and threatening and if we as Christians had behaved in a similar fashion we would probably have been arrested and this is because people today have chosen to believe a lie. Many different lies, of course, but all adding up into one big lie, which is what the Bible talks about. I think I might have mentioned it last time I was here. The strong delusion that God will send in the last days before the return of the Lord. And so many people have fallen for the lie and they have done what Jericho did. The people of Jericho had put their trust in what they thought was strong and substantial walls and they had wrapped themselves up in their imagined security. Strange what people believe in. People, <laughs> strange what people won't believe in. People say to me, oh, I don't believe in Jesus because I can't accept such and such. And I would say, well, the Jesus you don't believe in is a Jesus you yourself have made up. Did you understand that? There's a very well-known comedian who's always spouting his thing. I think he's upset the MCC, hasn't he, recently? But he's always saying, he's saying his thing as though he feels we want to know what he says. And he said, I can't believe in a God who sends children to hell. And, uh, but God doesn't send children to hell. So whether he believes in that God or not is irrelevant. Because that God is a God of his own imagination. It's the God that he has himself made up. And in the emergent church situation where people say, oh, we all believe in Jesus, they are actually believing in a Jesus of their own imagination, not the Jesus of the scripture. So we have to be careful where we're going. We have to acknowledge one thing. The devil has one desire, and that is to prevent people hearing and responding to the message of grace in the gospel of Christ. He will do many things, sometimes very dramatically but many times very quietly and circumspectly. But his one aim is to thwart the purposes of God and turn people away from the path of salvation. And in these days, when he knows his time is short, he is upping the ante and we see more attacks upon the gospel and more infiltration amongst the people of God than ever before. Even within the churches, there are people, often in leadership positions, who by their words and actions seek to divert the church from its one purpose on earth, that of preaching the good news of Christ and the whole counsel of God. Now, we in this church believe that there is only one way in which a man or woman might be saved to come to Christ in repentance and receive freely from him the forgiveness which can come only from him. God has in this way put before us an open door, but there is only one door. And the devil will do anything to prevent someone from finding the entrance to that door into glory. So Satan will try to substitute something else for the truth of God. That has been his way ever since he fell like lightning from heaven. And over the centuries, he's become more subtle and more hidden in his ways of doing it. But people will almost certainly fall for something. 
Some people will substitute their work, their families, their grandchildren, their football team, any worldly idol, and they'll put them in the place that God wishes to have for himself. But essentially, man is spiritual in nature. When I say man, that includes women, of course. Man with a capital N, mankind, includes women. But mankind is spiritual in nature. This is what marks him out from animals. God breathed into man. That's the big difference. Man is a spiritual being, and it's essentially a spiritual substitution that the devil realizes is needed to lead people astray. Men and women were created to worship their creator. And if they fail to give worship to him, they will give worship to something else. It's a spiritual certainty. We were created to inhabit the spiritual realm. Here in Ainsdale, you live in the physical realm, which is sometimes very difficult. But there is much for you to do within that physical realm in which you find yourselves on this day. But we are called on conversion to move up higher and inhabit the spiritual realm, which is where the words of Acts 17 verse 28 say we should live and move and have our being in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the realm in which we will spend eternity. And after conversion, we've already entered into it. The spiritual realm is not something you enter into when you die and go to heaven. It's in the now. The door to eternity is opened as you receive the Lord Jesus as Savior. The Bible says clearly, I've said this many times, I think I said it last month, we are seated in heavenly places, Ephesians 2 verse 6. It tells us that God raised us up together and made us sit in heavenly places. It will be fully realized at a future date, but it's already accomplished and settled once we have trusted in Jesus as Savior. So we find ourselves wrestling not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers which function in the spiritual realm against the rulers of the darkness of this world and against spiritual wickedness in high places, Ephesians 6. And this is the realm in which Satan does his utmost to lead people away from the truth by substituting something else instead of God's perfect way. And we have to realize and accept that there is a great spiritual deception going on in this world. And this spiritual deception is increasing with every day as we draw nearer to the Lord's return for his church. Whatever it is that keeps our loved ones from coming to Christ, it is spiritual in nature and can only be fought against and overcome by the spiritual means of prayer and intercession before the Lord. Our loved ones and others don't do it out of deliberate wickedness. They do it automatically, essentially, because it's spiritual in nature. And they do it because they don't want to consider eternal things. And they fill, I don't know whether you've noticed, but people today fill every minute of their lives with doing things. They're picking their kids up, they're picking their grandchildren up, they're taking them here, there and everywhere. When I was a child, I went to school, that was enough for me, a few hours at school a day. Day. That was more than enough. No desire to go anywhere else. I just wanted to come home at night. Uh, but now kids are going somewhere every night of the week. Parents are rushing backwards and forwards. Everybody's rushing backwards and forwards. And somebody on the radio the other day was saying they were going to Pilates, they were going to yoga, they were meeting somebody for coffee, they were having lunch out, then they were going to do this, that and the other. And the whole day was completely stuffed. Every day of the week. And I believe there's a spiritual reason for that. I believe the Bible's very clear. People are trying to exclude the necessity of thinking about eternal things. They are filling their lives. Every minute of their lives is filled up so they don't have time to think. I was on a bus the other day going to Halifax. You have to be careful when you go to Halifax. People like Jeff come from Halifax. You don't know what might happen. <laughs> 
but uh, I was sitting, we got stuck in the traffic. I was at the front seat of a double-decker, and uh, we got stuck in the traffic, and there was nothing to do, and instead of looking out of the window, I just looked back down the bus, just turned my head round and looked right down the bus, and it was nearly, there was somebody on every seat. There was a single person. I mean, all, all the seats were occupied, but nobody was sitting together, and it was com almost completely full right down the bus. Every single person was on the screen staring at a piece of you know, glass. Every, not just the young people, but the pensioners as well. Every single person, apart from me, was sat there. Their attention was somewhere else. And that's where we are today. People are being brainwashed and conditioned wholesale by the rubbish that they constantly watch. Children, teenagers, adults, grandma and granddad are all being conditioned with the stuff that they watch and listen to every moment of the day. I was affected as a child by the rubbish I watched on television. There were only three channels to choose from, I think, when I was at school. And that finished at about 11 o'clock and a little dot appeared in the screen. And you had to wait 20 minutes for a warm up. And then when it had warmed up, the horizontal old went and the news, Kenneth Kendall went round and round and round and round like that, I remember. But it was, you, you were affected by what you watched. But you could only watch for a couple of hours. It was time to go to bed. And there wasn't anything else. Kids now are watching screens all night long. Mum and Dad have got no idea what they're looking at. People are being conditioned. I believe people are being brainwashed by this constant necessity of having their attention taken up by something other than what's going on around. Did you follow that? Does that make any sense to you? And sadly, not all those who fill their time in this way are non-churchgoers. There are those who essentially do the same thing within their church life, taking on responsibilities, being on committees, officiating at services, arranging bring and buys or coffee mornings, taking part in charity sponsorships, and in this way, closing off all the corners of their lives so that the Holy Spirit has very little chance of being heard, even within the churches. Time has gone, so I'm going to just miss a, bit, miss a few notes out here. Because you are a member of a church that gets good spiritual, scriptural teaching, at least it does on other Sundays, <laughs> but you, because you're in the church that gets good scriptural teaching generally, you may not realize just how many people in churches are listening to rubbish on a daily, well, on a weekly basis, and for a very short time, 10 minutes for the sermon is considered to be more than enough. Actually, in most cases, two minutes would have been enough, but you know what I mean, 10, 10 minutes is considered to be enough, and the minister gets up and he says nothing. Look at the Archbishop of Canterbury, he is world famous for saying absolutely nothing. It takes a long time to say it, but he never says anything at all that's of any interest to anybody, because he's so busy sitting on the fence that until the fence finally collapses underneath the man, he's never going to say anything. We must understand that Satan is the master of deception. We must understand that things which are spiritual are not necessarily biblical. We should always judge things by their biblical foundation, not by their emotional appeal. What we do in church, what takes part in the services, the words of the songs that we sing, we should take notice that all things have a biblical foundation rather than just a nice feeling or an emotional appeal. But let's move on to look at things from the point of view of the Israelites. And first, a little bit more about knowledge. What is knowledge? Well, if I asked a five-year-old for the circumference of a circle which crossed the horizontal of the hypotenuse of a triangle at 66 degrees with a right angle and a logarithm of the cosine, I wouldn't really expect a five-year-old to be able to answer. I wouldn't ask most of you to be able to answer, to be honest, either. Let's face it. But it wouldn't be the child's fault that the child couldn't answer. Because a child of five has not yet been taught. Do you see the point? If you've never been taught, you can never know. And it's not really your fault. And that's the case in many churches. An urgent lack of knowledge 
because of the compromised, diluted and liberal teaching of many of the ministers and the leaders. But then we are all accountable before the Lord for our spiritual health. And we should all, taught or untaught, be able to discern when something is not right. And that's what worries me about much of the evangelical church. All kinds of shenanigans, unbiblical, even ungodly practices go on in churches and people don't seem to be able to discern that there's something wrong. I don't understand scientifically, I can't explain to you exactly the process that means that when you press that switch, the lights come on and off. I don't understand what happens between the switch and the light. Somebody's going to tell me at the end of the service, but I don't want to know, so I'll save you the job. I'm more concerned what happens when you switch the kettle on, whether, whether that works or not. But I can't tell you the workings. Do you see what I mean? I can't understand scientifically actually what happens when you click that switch, these lights come on. But I have enough discernment to know that if there's smoke coming out of it, you switch it off. That's the difference between knowledge, understanding, and discernment. You might not be able to explain biblically or scientifically or theologically exactly what's going on, but you should in your spirit be able to discern something is not right. And the problem with many churches today is people do not discern that something is wrong because they're just not in the right place. Sad lack of teaching in today's churches, but it's worse to see the much sadder lack of discernment among the people in the churches who should be more than able to show the difference between sound truth and obvious error. And in that case, it is the congregation's fault. You can't all just point at the guy at the front and say, well, he didn't tell us. In that case, it is the congregation's fault when open heresy is proclaimed on a regular basis from their pulpits and something which they will be expected to answer for. I had this problem oh, over the years. I used to go, I was a member of the Methodist Church for a long time. I was trained as a Methodist preacher. And I came out, oh, well, 30 something years ago now I wrote a letter telling them why I was coming out of the whole thing but uh, I did preach occasionally in some denominational churches for a while and I was I, but I went to when I was in Cornwall I think I was only there a short time I worked and lived in Cornwall and I went to a church and the guy that was in the pulpit I was only in the congregation guy that was in the pulpit started talking about auras and colors I realized he was a spiritualist he was taking the service in a, in a non-conformist Protestant church and he was introducing spiritist doctrine into the pulpit. And nobody seemed to you know, have any problem with it. And I didn't know what to do. I got myself all worked up. You know how it is. <laughs> Linda, you know how it is. I got myself all worked up. <laughs> And, and I didn't know what to do. I thought, well, I can't, I'm a stranger. I'm only visiting, really. I can't just get up and start proclaiming things. But I've got to speak to somebody. So at the end of the service, I collared the guy in a Methodist church. It's a, a steward, uh, or a, side, a steward or a sidesman or whatever, uh, like being a deacon. And they're in charge of what happens in the church on a daily basis. So I went to speak to him. I said, can I have a word, urgent word? quickly but fairly quietly I said I'm really concerned I didn't know whether I should say anything you see I really didn't know it was my place to say anything but I said we need discernment I believe that what the man was saying was spiritism I think it was highly dangerous and I think you must make sure it never ever happens again do not have this man in your pulpit in this church and he was very really, mm, well we've all got, we've, we're a broad church and we accept all, all different points of view so this is a problem but at this point another lady came up sidled up very shyly quite an elderly lady and she said excuse me she said, but are you talking about the sermon and I quite reluctantly said well yes actually we are and, and she said well what is it you're saying so I was able to tell her what I just said to her, and she said oh thank the Lord she said that somebody thinks the same as me so because I was thinking that but she was too frightened to say anything 
She was too worried that she might be in the wrong. She was too worried that the religious leaders might stomp on her and she would feel foolish. But thankfully, because of the conversation we were having, I thought we were having it privately, quietly, she was able to come in on the edge. And she was, and because I came out thinking, I don't know whether I got anywhere with, the, with the, you know, the, the people in charge, but at least that one person is going home encouraged because she found somebody who believed the same as her and was prepared to say something about it. But so much of the time, stuff is talked in pulpits, it's never questioned. I am, I get questioned all the time. There's always somebody comes at the end and says, what did you mean by such and such? And it's usually very warm-hearted, and, you know, but sometimes it isn't. But there's a sad lacking of teaching, and it is the congregation's fault if they allow heresy on a weekly basis to be proclaimed from their pulpit. Many times I've heard supporters of the ecumenical movement telling me we're just concentrating on what we can agree on for the sake of unity. When you place Romanist dogma against biblical teaching, there really isn't anything you can agree on. It's a false dream. There is nothing to agree on, right at the very basic foundation of the whole thing. Time and again, leaders of non-conformist churches have brought shame upon the gospel of Christ because they have compromised the great tenets of faith by diluting their preaching and glossing over large proportion of scripture for unity's sake in order to continue being a member of an organization to show a piece of paper that they've been accepted. And what? they are getting involved in is much more serious than simple church compromise. It's far more important than that. We're in a spiritual battle here. The spiritual battle has never been so real as it is today. That in itself is evidence that the Lord's return is near. The Lord's return is imminent. Satan knows that. He doesn't know the day nor the hour any more than we do, but he knows enough. He's read the scripture. Truth mixed with error is more fatal to the Lord's people than any error that stands on its own. I think I've demonstrated that in the past. And for that reason, our pulpits must be fenced and protected, and our people must be taught to read and search the scriptures for themselves as the Bereans did, it says in the New Testament. Otherwise, when the people of God are called to take Jericho, There'll be a very unexpected and a very sad result. The trumpet sound must be clear and loud. But the trumpet call itself cannot do anything. The people have to be ready and willing and obedient to that which they know is the Lord's purpose. With an ear which listens for and recognizes his voice. And perhaps it's good in closing. It's a good word, that, isn't it? In closing. I was talking to somebody the other day and they said, oh, I like it when so-and-so comes to preach. He, he says, uh, in conclusion, and he concludes. Uh, and the other guy says, uh, I'm leading towards a car and just carries on going for another half hour or so, but you know what? It's good to take note as we close of that period of silence. And I didn't see this for a long time, read the story many times, preached on it more than once. But I noticed late in time, I noticed that period of silence that Joshua specifically enjoins upon the people in Joshua chapter six. Might it be worth noting that the great shout which was so effective that the walls came down, followed a period of enforced quietness. And whether you noticed it as uh, it was read to us this morning, Joshua specifically told them, do not say anything until I give the command to shout. There was complete silence. Imagine what the people of Jericho thought when they saw these people going round and round the city walls. In complete silence for quite a long time. Prayer and contemplation upon the purposes of the Lord should be where we sit 
on a daily basis. In quietness before him, away from the clamor and the clanging of the world outside. Perhaps sometimes there is a little too much noise from the Christian church. Too much noise in the form of dashing after the latest experience or running around in circles trying to grab hold of the latest blessing. Too much noise taking again the concentration away from where it really needs to be. Study, prayer and meditation of his word are the things which will keep our hearts holy and our minds free from the distractions of false spirituality. And every Christian can live on a daily basis in that reality because we have a saviour who is living and personal to each and every one of his children in whatever situation we find ourselves. When we cultivate a personal prayerful relationship with the Lord, we will find ourselves moving under his direction with the spiritual discernment that comes from the Holy Ghost. The Saviour who is personal to you wishes to have your heart and soul and a complete first claim on your life. Every other consideration should be secondary. In this church you have the great blessing of being well taught. Take that blessing and use it to deepen your experience with Jesus. Make your prayers more fervent and your boldness more courageous. Joshua spent time in God's presence. Perhaps the most important two verses. And he didn't even read them. Because I didn't ask him to read them. Because I was keeping it to the end, you see. The most important two verses were the last two verses of the chapter before. Joshua 5 verses 14 and 15 I think explains the whole thing because Joshua spent time in God's presence he worshipped in a holy place he had an account an encounter with the host of the Lord who said take off your shoes because the ground on which you stand is holy he had an encounter a spiritual encounter with the living Son of God. And that was what gave him the power to lead the people. That was what gave him the position that God had purposed for him. And that was ultimately what led to the falling down of the walls. I went to Sunday school. I'm very glad I went to Sunday school. I didn't want to go at the time, but I'm glad I went. Looking back, because it's a tremendous Christian heritage that so many children don't have nowadays, which is a great tragedy. But I went to Sunday school and I learned all the Sunday school songs. And I learned one that was essentially nonsense. You might know it yourself. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. Jericho. It's rubbish that. There wasn't any battle. You just read the chapter. The walls fell down. I, I grew up on that song. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. He didn't. It's not true. There wasn't a battle. There was a period of silence. Contemplation concentrating on the things that God was going to do. Then there was an instruction from God's man and there was a great shout and the walls fell down. That's not a battle, is it? That's God's answer coming to fruition. His answer for you is already sorted. All we have to do is wait for his timing and fit in with his purposes. Every member of this congregation is to be part of a victorious army because it doesn't depend on us. It doesn't depend on our strength or our ability. It isn't a battle. Every member of this congregation can receive the blessing of victory, the winning of souls and see the downfall of evil. But every member has a responsibility to seek and search, to pray and intercede before the throne of grace. As each individual person wins that victory in their private spiritual lives, so then this church as a local body of believers will begin to see the moving of the Holy Spirit 
and the blessing of God individually and communally for his glory. Amen.